Hey everyone, uh, this is Gio, and welcome to a new episode of Games I Speak. And I'm Josie. Uh, so today uh, we have a lot of things to cover. Um, actually, you know what? This was kind of a slow week, except for the, <laughs> the big releases that came out this week, which were Ghost of Tsushima and uh, Paper Mario, the Origami King. So... Uh, basically, I'm going to start off uh, with some more industry news, and then at the end, we'll kind of go over our initial impressions of uh, Ghost of Tsushima, because I, I just got my copy, so I played it this morning. Cool. Uh, so, all right. So, first up, um, there's kind of a, some new uh, information regarding... Um, Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Did you uh, see the newest video that they came out with? Uh, I the last video I saw was the Ubi Forward video, um, and and the conversation there. I haven't seen another video after that. Okay, <laughs> so I guess uh, I'll just go over uh, some of the mechanics that th this article is talking about, and then we can kind of talk about what we think about the game. So um, essentially. This version of Assassin's Creed is set in the ninth century, and it's basically about a Viking invasion of England. And so the main character is Ivor. Is that am I saying it right? Ivor. Ivor. So she's a Viking, and she's a member of a clan, and they're essentially trying to capture a area that they call East Anglia. And, um, so, I mean, essentially you play as her and you use your clan to kind of help you, uh, navigate through the lands and, and take on certain, uh, battles to capture areas. And, um, so some of the things that I, I read in here that were interesting was she can summon her longboat and then her clan will basically come to her aid and fight with her. So that's actually pretty yeah. cool. Um, How does that work in a landlocked area? I don't think... I think she can only summon it along the coast. So it will probably help her take on uh, coastal fortresses. Um, unless it's a flying ship, which would be cr pretty crazy. <laughs> yes, exactly. By the power of Odin. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the other thing is... Um, she so they have a uh, castle assault similar to conquest battles in Odyssey. Did you play Odyssey? No, uh, I actually just recently purchased Origins. Okay, and uh, I haven't played it yet though. Okay, but uh, I got Origins ten dollars from Walmart. So oh. shout out to Walmart for the for keeping the prices low. Yeah. <laughs> um and so the game has open world uh, exploration. Uh, and she can use several weapons. Uh, there's axes, flails, shields, and daggers. Um, she can unlock special abilities that she can you can trigger uh, or you can map to your uh, trigger keys. And she has a, a special ability called Odin Sight, which allows her to like see um, important targets on the map when she does it. Um, and then, uh, there's random world events you can participate in as well as mini games like drinking games, like classic, <laughs> classic Assassin's Creed. Yeah. Fair. And then she has a black Raven companion named Sinan that allows her to scout ahead. So she, I, I think she can like tune into what the, the Raven sees and then you can use that knowledge, uh, as far as like how to advance. Yeah, they're playing off of the uh, the Viking mythology. Odin, he had two ravens. Mm -hmm. Odin's raven. Yeah. <laughs> Funin, Funin and Mujin, something like that. Memory and thought. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, I didn't know that. Uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah, um, I mean, so I, I've, I'm not a big uh, player of the Assassin's Creed franchise, um, but... I mean, I don't know. I think that sounds pretty cool. Um, I'm kind of so, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, so from from what I saw of the Ubi Ford, uh, it does look pretty cool. I I, I agree. I, th I think it looks 
pretty brutal. Mm -hmm. It's very violent, and a lot of the moves are very cool. You can actually choose between male or female Ivors. Oh, okay. So, so you don't have to just have one or the other. And uh, the it seems like more Assassin's Creed. It doesn't seem like it's really leaping forward in terms of Assassin's Creed yet. Yeah. For me, at the very least, I actually stopped playing uh, on Assassin's Creed Brotherhood. Mm -hmm. I need. I, I want to play Black Flag. But I also really wanted to like be in ancient Egypt. That's why I bought Origins, and also the price point was just too good. Yeah, yeah. But Valhalla definitely piqued my interest in terms of the setting mm -hmm. and the brutal combat. Uh, but I need to see a little bit more to be swayed to kind of like get it as a day one purchase. Because right now it's more like I can wait, and, you know, see how it fares. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, so like, I'm, I'm looking. Like, like, like I know you haven't played Assassin's Creed, but do you feel like, hey, you know, just hearing from it, like I want to buy this day one? Um, no, I think I'm more like you. So I really want to see how the uh, the castle assaults are. Yes. Because if those are like really intense and like kind of like um, accurate, you know, portrayals of invading a castle, um, then yeah, that, that might sell me alone because that seems like it's kind of like, you remember in uh, Far Cry 3 when you would invade yes. the little uh, fortresses? Yeah. No, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. I actually just saw Far Cry 4. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I feel like that mechanic that they they or that kind of like a scenario that they captured in Far Cry Three, I feel like a lot of games have been uh, kind of building off and and turning it into their own kind of uh, you know, I guess customizing it in a way that fits their game. And so, well, I mean, part of Ubisoft game. So Ubisoft, you know, no offense to Ubisoft, and you know, more power to them. Yeah. They kind of cannibalize their own gameplay yeah. from different uh different franchises yeah and mix them together i mean division's a really good example of that yeah so if if they did take the concept of that from far cry mm -hmm. then i would be totally game for that because that was like one of the that and hunting like the different uh animals was like yeah like getting the king animal and then you could craft like a unique item out of that yeah I'm going to say, I'm going to say two words to you. What? Komodo dragon. Oh yeah. <laughs> Dan, those things were nasty, man. They were so <laughs> lethal. Yeah. They're brutal. What about those birds? Kasiwa Kasiara Kasiwaras? I, I forget it, but you remember the, that yeah, bird? Man. It was kind of like an dragon ostrich. It really sticks out to me because those, they were so low and they'd be like, you just like suddenly get ganked by one. Yeah. It was, it was ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> um. So yeah, I mean. I definitely want to see that uh, castle uh, attacking, um, and then also like how she summons the ship and she uses her bird. Yeah, those all seem like really cool mechanics. So I'm definitely. If anything, looking. Uh, you know, I, I, these Assassin's Creed games have become more RPG styled, and I, I I dig that. Yeah. But from what I heard of Origins, one of the it, one of the major issues is like when you're trying to gank a, uh, an NPC, mm -hmm. and. Uh, you can't you, you like you the stealth kill doesn't take because the power level disparity is there mm -hmm. like there are too many levels above you so yeah. it's like oh you took some health off of me but that would have instantly killed an npc in previous assassin's creed games so i i wonder how they're gonna uh factor that in yeah they're probably doing that to so that the the player can't break the game yeah yeah so all right uh next up we have some industry news here. Um, so basically, uh, Google Stadia, they're kind of taking a page out of Sony's book and they're trying to build up some exclusive titles to bring the... And look, you and me say it all the time. It's the games. That's what brings the players in. So it seems like they're trying to capitalize on that in the most like, you know, basically exclusive. So you can only get this game here on Google Stadia. So I'm just going to go over quickly what um, some of the studios. Uh, so they're signing five developers to create exclusive titles. Um, Splash Damage, which is uh, developed Gears Tactics. And they're the one making this uh, Orcs Must Die 3 game. 
So that's already been announced. Um, and I've then, never even heard of Worst Must Die One or Two. Yeah, you know, I've heard of it. I've never played it though. It looks like a kind of like a cartoonish. Uh, man, what are those games where like you set up traps and stuff? Um, uh, tower defense. Yeah, I think I think so. I, but that's just off the top of my head. Um. Oh, okay. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Splash Damage is making a multiplayer game called Outcasters. Okay. Uh, Robot Entertainment. They're the ones doing Orcs Must Die. And okay. then they're hiring rock band developer Harmonix and Until Dawn uh, Studio Supermassive Games. And so they're supposed to work on exclusive titles as well. And then they're bringing in a more unknown developer called Uppercut Games. And they made uh, mobile games Epoch and submerged so that's pretty much um their play right now they're ju they're just trying to <laughs> throw stay money afloat. yeah they're trying to stay afloat <laughs> yeah so i mean what do you think do you think uh and, and we're gonna get into the xbox news later um but so what do you think do you think they're making the right moves or do you think that's good for gamers do you think it's bad for gamers what do you what do you think I think choice in general is never bad for gamers, uh, but what they're doing as a business, mm -hmm. I think it's too little too late okay. in terms of, you know, when they came out with this program, I was like, what, who would be interested in this? Mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's actually expensive to just buy the games, not have any ownership over them. Mm -hmm. Yes, you have the ability to play them anywhere technically, but you're restricted to specific devices. And, and all you need the, insane hmm? bandwidth. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, so it, it it all seemed like a failing proposition to me to begin with. Not to mention they didn't even have any kind of exclusives to become a selling point. They had all these games that already existed elsewhere. Yeah. Uh, what what they have? Uh, Destiny. I think Destiny came out on it. Division. Division maybe, and some Square Enix titles like Final Fantasy 15, yeah. and they all ran poorly. Or even worse, on the on Stadia platform. Yes. So to me, and how long has this been out for? Like a year now. Yeah, I think I, so. I just haven't really been paying year. attention. And yeah. to be honest, I think it's too little, too late. These don't seem like system selling games. No. At all. No. Uh, Orcs Must Die doesn't say anything to me. No. Um, Harmonics, I can't recall the last game they made. And Rock Band, you know, has gone down the wayside. Even when they tried to revive it with Rock Band Live, I believe. Yeah, it hasn't. It just, yeah. it just didn't take. I think people so, played enough of Rock Band. Excuse me? <laughs> I think people just played enough of Rock Band. Fair. You know, fair, like, but I mean, I mean, there's always a new generation of gamers coming out. Yeah. I mean, people... <laughs> People are growing up with gaming, and I think they could attract that new generation, but somehow it's missing. Yeah. Um, and again, we'll, we'll talk about what Xbox is doing, but I just don't see the future being so bright for Stadia. Yeah. Um, so I do want to say uh, that they are kind of... Um, so if we lived in South Korea, where they have a like infrastructure that's one of the best in the world for broadband. Yes. If you live somewhere like South Korea, I think it's definitely more doable, but like internet, I mean, I have friends who have horrible internet and they live like 10 miles down the road. You you're, know what I mean? Like, one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I have, I have Cox. Yeah. I don't have a uh, Verizon. Yeah. So. Yeah, so internet in the states is not where it needs to be, and um, so I do know though. I just read this the other day. Apparently, um, Joe Biden was saying if he wins, he's gonna he's gonna try to build a uh, new inf internet infrastructure uh, for America. So that that is something that is sorely needed in America. The, we just don't have the 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 backbone needed for Stadia. I mean, I'm, it's just not there. Honestly, the internet should be a utility. Everyone should have internet. Yeah, so that's what in, the in, program is in, supposed in, to be a municipal uh, broadband. So yeah, it's supposed to be in, more in, like in a my utility. honest opinion, the pandemic has definitely shown that 
people need internet and especially now where businesses have been closed and a lot of things have been taken to home. Yeah. A lot of people need the internet to survive yeah. and to just accomplish their day to day work. Yes. So and, go ahead. And and I was just gonna say like cable companies, they're not responsible. They don't they don't use their profits to keep building up their infrastructure. They just don't do it. So yeah, I think we do need kind of like a public utility. Yeah, you pay for it. But it's maintained in a way where everyone is given the the best internet access available to them. I, I really yeah, think exactly. that's what's like needed. Stop, stop, stop uh, blocking or gating or throttling internet. Yeah. For, for what purpose? Well, I mean, it just... It, to, to, to make a profit. To make a profit. But right now, it's actually hurting the economy because everyone's exactly. working from home, like you said. So I'm fully on board with that. So, And I'm gaming from home and I need that broadband. <laughs> To, 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 yeah. to play my MMOs. It's the it's the upload of cable. The upload of cable is horrendous. Yes. It is so bad. Um, but yeah, I mean, I lucked out. I got Fios. But even then, I mean, we had to have like a meeting and then we had to vote to have it. And it was just like, God, it's so annoying. All right. Uh, next up. So now we're going to get into the Xbox stuff. Um, so, so this is something that I actually saw uh during the week i didn't see anyone talking about it but and i'm sure these details have already been revealed but essentially <laughs> microsoft has something that they call velocity architecture and this goes into what we were talking about so essentially this is a series of hardware upgrades and software upgrades to the new xbox that are going to really um, kind of flesh out streaming games. So that's what this is all dedicated to, streaming content. So let's go down here and I'll just kind of briefly touch over these. So the first one is a one terabyte NVMe SSD. So if you don't know what those are, they're just, <laughs> they're kind of like SSD drives but they're shaped more like RAM cards. So they're smaller. They're very thin. Yeah, they're very thin. So th apparently this one does 2.4 gigabytes of raw input and output, and it's 40 times the, thru the throughput of Xbox One. So it allows much more data transfer than the Xbox One. Um, hardware accelerated decompression. Uh, so they, they built a proprietary algorithm that allows them to send texture data approximately a hundred times faster the current uh, generation does. And they have a direct storage um, API, which <laughs> this, let's see. So this allows developers to have more control over um, file manipulation and allows them to uh, optimize it more. And then they have a sampler feedback uh, streaming and it allows you to load a uh, certain uh, portions of a MIP which apparently reading this article is something I learned about it's a uh, it's how they um, store like data about the uh, environment in the game mm. so um, this this results in approximately 2.5 times the effective input and output throughput of memory usage above and beyond the raw hardware capability on average. So, um, so yeah, I mean, it, it, it really looks like uh, Microsoft is investing a lot of uh, research and uh, development into streaming games. I mean, that's basically what this is telling me. But wait, so what was the, the those hard but those were hardware specs. Those were located in the Xbox Series X. Yes, yeah, but it's all designed to make streaming content faster. Gotcha. Gotcha. So it's it it all plays into the whole cloud infrastructure that they're working on right now. I mean, at this point, what is the difference between the Series X and a PC? Nothing. I mean, well, the first Xbox, there was no difference between the, an Xbox and a PC. The first Xbox was a, was a PC. So Microsoft, I mean, they made... I mean, it had an 8 gigabyte hard drive. It, it was kind of a big difference because 8 gigabytes, you're not going to get anywhere. No, I mean like the, the infrastructure of it. 
the way it was designed. 11 pounds. Yeah, it was basically a PC. I mean, that's basically what it was. It was huge. It was like this big. No, no. I I mean, I have it. I I know. Yeah. But um, yeah, you're right. There is no difference, really. They're just... They, they all the only difference is that they the software on it and and but but here's the the key difference i'm seeing from this next generation is that they're trying to use proprietary techniques to actually make it faster than a gaming pc that you can just go out and buy so well, that's the difference and, and that I'm seeing. And technically cheaper. And technically cheaper. Now. Because, because with the gaming PC, you're going to want a gaming monitor. You're not going to use it on your TV. No. These systems are made to be used on your television. Which is a big difference. Yes. Yeah. And, and uh, I mean, you're not dealing anywhere near with the same refresh rates either. Yeah, my gaming monitor has 200 hertz refresh rate. So, so I guess my question is, because we've had this discussion offline, and I think this is a good time to bring it up, and I actually sent you a video from another YouTuber, Radical Reggie, Yeah, and he's also a collector like we are, and he was saying about how, yeah, the writing's on the wall, physical copies are going to go on the wayside, and you know what, what do you do as a collector looking forward? And we spoke about this and I was thinking, you know, I'm going to go ahead, go to PC and just, you know, survive off of Steam sales and Humble Bundles and good old games, something like that, you know? I, yeah. And um, and in that regard, like, it just it just feels like these consoles or this next generation of consoles, especially on Xbox's end, where they don't really have uh, exclusives to speak of. And even then, those exclusives are available on PC. Mm-hmm. I just don't understand why not invest in a PC. Yes, and so that'll that'll bring us to the next uh, piece of uh, information I wanted to talk about, okay. which basically encompasses all this. And we and and then and after this, let's really like have a discussion on where we think this is going because I I think a lot of people are wondering right now. Um, Sounds good. So. That brings us up to the Xbox Game Pass. Now, we uh, basically were um, we're wondering how how is Stadia going to survive? Because so let me go over what this Game Pass entails. Um, all right. So here you have the Ultimate. The Ultimate covers PC gaming, console gaming, and you get a gold membership. This is for fifteen, uh, fourteen ninety nine a month. You get the first month for a dollar. So I don't see. I'm I'm definitely gonna try uh, the PC one out. Um, so you get access to over a hundred games, console and PC games. New games are added all the time, and Xbox Studio titles are the same day as release. That's so. The more exclusives Xbox does get, the more valuable this thing becomes. Then yes. you have the PC membership, which is four ninety nine a month, and that also gets you over a hundred games, and you get the titles uh, released. It does not come with gold, and then you have the console, which is nine ninety nine a month, um, and that gives you the the console games. So now let's just looking at that uh, those prices. They're already incentivizing PC because the PC, you get the same thing and it's half the price. You're paying four ninety nine dollars for the PC. More than half the price, bro. What? It's a third of the price. Yeah, yeah. No, no. I'm talking about uh, just the console one, which was nine ninety nine. Gotcha. So, so, okay. Let's, first of all, Google Stadia doesn't stand a chance against this. <laughs> I mean. Not at all. There's no way, because how much is Google Stadia right now? It's like fifteen dollars or something, or nine. They have two different ones, right? I think. Uh, I don't think it's that. It's the uh, I, there's a subscription, and on top of that subscription, you need to pay for the game. Yeah, yeah. And that's one of the reasons why Google Stadia is just not attractive at all from a financial standpoint, because you're paying full price for the digital game still. Yeah, unless it's a, a exclusive that they're going to come out with, mm. which they don't really have any right now. So. Um, now, so yeah, I think I think this is a Google Stadia killer. 
That's what I think this is. Um, and it also shows that, yes, your hunch is correct. They are incentivizing PC play more. And um, so now I, I can tell you how I feel about this. I don't care. I've been a PC gamer since the 90s. Or actually, yeah, since the 90s. Um, you're, you're a PC gamer since the womb, bro. Since the womb, pretty much. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, StarCraft came out in 98. My parents bought me a copy the day it came the yeah the day it came out. So I've been a PC gamer forever. Yeah. Um, World of Warcraft 2004. I've been I played that for many many years. So I know how I feel, <laughs> which is I uh, PC gamers like me have always been saying that PC is the way. And but but that doesn't take away from the fact that I own consoles and love consoles too. Yes. And and the reason why is because for the last five years, it's damn near impossible to buy a physical copy of a PC game now. So if you're a collector like you and me, <laughs> then console really is the only game in town. So now that leads me to uh, what you think about this, because as a collector, as a very strong collector, I mean, we can see the wall behind you of... <laughs> You're a massive collector. So how do you feel about the prospect of losing this, you know, losing the ability to collect all these games for consoles if, if it's going towards PC? So, I mean, like, I, it's, it's disappointing, it's just the future that we're going through. Uh, it's not, not to mean that, you know, I can't adapt to it. It's just, you know, you have to adapt in certain ways. That's, that's you know, true to yourself, I guess. Yeah. And true to myself is literally waiting for sales because buying digital games at full price, it seems silly to me. I just, I, I don't see, I don't see the value in it. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's weird to say that, but, you know, with a physical copy, it's an investment. And, and for certain games, that investment grows. A lot of the wall behind me, they're worth more than, they they were new and unopened when yes. they first came out yeah you know and so uh i see i see the value there not just in the game itself but also ownership of the game when it be, when it comes to digital i'm wary of it and my examples for being wary are something like scott pilgrim versus the world yeah where you know i purchased that day one and the, that, that's a rare occurrence but i was so excited for it mm -hmm. i was like i need to play this game I purchased that day one. I think it was fourteen ninety nine, nineteen ninety nine, and you know Ubisoft took it off the market. They took it off the digital digital landscape, so people aren't even able to access it anymore. The, and most recently, that happened with uh, Ducktales, the the Ducktales remastered. Yeah, they took it off the digital storefront everywhere, and like people were scrambling to buy it physically, and the prices rose considerably because people are like, "There's no other way to play this game." Yes, and so. Ownership rights is incredibly important to me, and I feel like we're giving that free that, that those rights away when we succumb to a completely digital uh, digital storefront or digital culture. Yes, I don't know. I don't. I don't know how to state that. But at the same time, like I have Netflix, I don't mind watching all my movies on Netflix. And here's the thing: when there is a movie that I really like, I do buy it physically. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I have it available to me even when it's off the, the, you know, whatever digital marketplace I'm trying to watch it on. Yeah. Because sometimes they'll take it off the, they'll take it off Amazon Prime and it'll be like only for rent, you know? So it's like, why pay for something and rent it each time I want to watch it when I can own it and one flat fee? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very difficult for me to move into a digital storefront. So that's why I say, I think PC is the way to go rather than console because, just look at the console generations. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of games are locked to their specific consoles. I've been collecting for Sega CD and Sega Saturn, and there's a lot of games there that aren't available anywhere else. Nope. And uh, take, for instance, the Wii Marketplace. The Wii Marketplace was pretty awesome. I love the Wii store, uh, the, the Wii eShop. And I bought a lot of games before 
they, they, they actually closed it down. That's no longer available anywhere except for no. through illegal channels, which I, I don't use. Yeah. Um, the morality of that can be discussed at another time, but I just don't use it. Yeah. So, you know, I wanted to own them and I owned them on my Wii U through the Wii marketplace. But what if my Wii U breaks? Yep. Those games are gone. I can't re-download them. Nope. And then that's that's what plays into the, the this digital future. It's like with PC and Steam, I trust that architecture and I trust purchasing games through Steam and how uh, their the time that they've been available and and they've been consistent is important and it's a selling point. Yeah, they've been, dude. I, I mean, I believe I've had a Steam account for ten over ten years, probably. It's like, like I, I'm dreading the day that PlayStation does something and gets rid of the PlayStation 3 and PlayStation P, PSP and PlayStation Vita games off of their digital marketplace. Yeah. Because Microsoft did that already with their Xbox 360 arcade titles, yep. which you know about. Yeah. And I uh... so his, historically speaking, a lot of digital only content disappears at the whim of the publishers. Yes. And I, I don't like that. When you have ownership of something, you actually can, you know, play it. Yeah. I, can, I, can, I, can, like, I, I can go ahead and get Secret of Mana on my Super Nintendo, play it, no install, don't have to worry about that, straight up. Yeah, and um, I do want to bring up a, a important fact that the video you sent me, the, the what's his, the, the guy's name? Radical so, Reggie. Radical Reggie. He brought up a good point. He was like, <laughs> what if... 10 years from now, right? It's all digital. And they made Silent Hill, right? And everybody loved it. It was a great game. And then they pulled it from the market. And then Konami was like, pretty much what they're doing now. They're like, yeah, we're not going to make any more Silent Hill games. And everyone's like, oh my God, I can't play it. I can't play it. I mean, that's what's going to happen to a lot of titles if if what you're if what it ha- we have seen happen yeah continues to happen and um it already with konami and um well you can say pt was a demo okay pt is a demo yeah. so it doesn't have to stay on the marketplace i totally it, get that though i loved it and i would love to have access to it yeah but castlevania at the adventure rebirth that was available only through the Wii Marketplace, through the Wii eShop. You can't play it anywhere else. Mm-hmm. It's not gonna. It's not part of the Castlevania collection. You're, it's only you're only playing Castlevania: The Adventure from the Game Boy version. Mm-hmm. But the Wii like re, uh, remake mm-hmm. was so good. It's a yeah. lot of fun. Me being a huge Castlevania fan, and it's not available anywhere else. Yeah, like um, for me, the the sore spot, like you said, was Xbox 360 Arcade. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, they came out with a remastered version of uh, Marvel Origins and uh, which is basically um, Marvel superheroes versus um, or yeah Marvel superheroes versus Capcom I believe I'm probably butchering the title but um, I have Marvel superheroes the first one on uh, the arcade one up and yes. that's just Marvel superheroes. Uh, but then there's another version where they have Capcom characters. Um, so they they remade that, and then they had uh, oh oh you know what? They also remade Marvel vs. Capcom two. Yes, and um, I remember that. Yeah, they were only on the Xbox 360, and they were on were they on the PS? Uh, PlayStation Network? I yeah. don't know. I, I predominantly used the Xbox 360 uh, marketplace before. Yeah, but they were up there, and then they took them down at, because uh, Capcom lost their license with Marvel. So they had Same to take... Same thing with the X-Men arcade game. I actually had the X-Men arcade game, the brawler. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and uh, I, I had that digitally you know, downloaded, and then I sold my Xbox 360, and then I got another Xbox 360 like a couple of years back, and I logged into my account. I'm unable to download it. Yes. Yeah. So, and then and then there's the whole fiasco. I, I, I need to double check. There's a there's a guy on uh, YouTube. I think his name is uh, Smoke Monster. He uh, <laughs> he's a pretty uh, hardcore um, arcade guy, and um, he he like 
there's a video on YouTube. You can watch it. It's a great video where he just goes through his modded Xbox 360. And it's like incredible what he has on there. But he's all these titles he's going over, you can't get them anymore. They're gone. The only way you can get it is a modded at 360. And let me tell you, <laughs> it's not easy or cheap to do that because I have one. You can't yeah, just, I remember when you got it. Yeah, you can't just do it on your own. You need a, you need someone who knows what they're doing to do it. And then you have to like it, – it's, it's, it's a huge thing. But yeah, I mean, if we go digital only um, – we're going to lose a lot of games and we're going to lose a lot so, of uh, history. So I don't know if you remember, and I can't recall the actual game I was playing, but I remember when I first started getting into mobile gaming mm -hmm. and mobile gaming, I didn't even have like a smartphone in order to play mobile gaming. I had an, um, one of those iPods, mm -hmm. those, uh, those, those iPods with like video and stuff like that. Yeah. Anyways, so I bought like a lot of games like that and I was hooked on these tower defense games, funny enough, that we were talking about earlier. And I would come back home uh, after like work or school and I would just lie down on a couch and I would just play these mobile games and I would get like hooked and just play them. And it was kind of like a, a cycle, if you will. What about Unicorn Attack? Uh, super uh, super Sup Robot Unicorn Attack or Robot Unicorn Attack? Is it Robot Unicorn? Yeah. Yeah. That game I love was that. awesome. That game was a lot of fun. Yeah. The, the, the Endless Runners. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which, I mean, I don't know. I don't think it would work for me on a console, but they worked for me f digitally, yes. like either on my iPod or my iPad. Yeah. Anyways, what I'm trying to say is the games, I was playing them, and this is this is just a personal anecdote, so I don't, it, it could be different for people, but I'm just explaining how I feel. In that, as I was playing these games, I noticed that I wasn't really going anywhere with them. And even when I was playing RPGs, I didn't feel like, they were as meaningful to me. And I'm talking about RPGs made for mobile. I'm not mm -hmm. talking about mo uh, RPGs that were uh, ported to mobile, kind of like something like Chrono Trigger or something okay. like that. And I didn't find the value of them to be there, even though they were cheap. The The barrier of entry was like $1.99, yeah. 99 cents sometimes. Uh, like I remember Doodle Jump. That was like a fun game. And I would just spend hours on it just trying to get just trying to max out my score. They're like yeah. arcade games. Yeah. Anyways, what I feel is is happening is that when with games going to a digital landscape, the value of the game and the accessibility of the games will blow up like they are in terms of the switch eShop. And there's a lot of trash on the Switch eShop. And so I find it very difficult to even peruse that digital landscape. Yeah. And and see, you know, what what stands out from the good and the bad. Yeah. And of course that's subjective. Yeah, it's subjective. But 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 that's what I'm what I'm that's what I'm trying to get at is that on mobile I was enthralled and I played the games and I probably, you know, I played so, so much of them and spent so much time on them that they were probably worth more than what I spent on them. Yeah. But ultimately at the end of the day, all those experiences kind of melded <laughs> together and th that, that, uh, that lowered the value of it for me in terms of gameplay, in terms of spent time spent on it mm -hmm. to the point where I just don't even really play mobile games. Yeah. I don't, I don't find it that fun. Even even though those experiences could be similar to something that you find on the Switch, because some mobile games are coming to uh, the Switch eShop. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And there's some there's some uh, there's some good games that are on mobile, like yes. um, PUBG, Fortnite. Um, there's a Minecraft. League of <laughs> Yeah, Minecraft. There's a League of Legends uh, game. Um, and that's on. I play that on my phone all the time. Um, so that there, speaks to the type of gamer you are. Yes. Now there are some games that you can take from a, a PC and shift them to mobile, and they just work. But then there's a lot of games that don't. And um, yeah, so I, I get what you're saying. The satisfaction is not. It's just not there, and um, not at least, at least for me. I'm speaking specifically about my experience. Yeah, no, that's, I, I. That's what's kind of informing how I feel going forward with the digital landscape. That I would like to go ahead and maybe invest in a decent computer that can play games 
well mm-hmm. and a wide variety of games like uh, you know and probably and probably have to upgrade it every so often but uh and then purchase whatever games i do want on sale yeah and so that brings me to the next uh thing uh so we have companies like uh limited run super rare games um what was the third one that we order from sometimes strictly limited yeah strictly limited so we we were talking about this earlier signature Sign- yeah they can only survive as long as the console can read media right so so let's say 10th generation consoles come out and they're they're discless and and they they're only digital so though even those companies can't survive anymore you know what i mean so it's like well and, and they don't even make computers with um they, they don't even uh sell computers with cd drives anymore it's all usb so, or whatever so one thing that i could give out to at the very least limited run i don't know about everyone else but limited run they have steadily been shifting their focus and not completely don't get me wrong but they've been steadily shifting their focus to highly sought after older games Mm -hmm. and having uh what's it called like really high class reproductions of those games a great example is shantae on game boy Mm -hmm. they are they are remaking that game uh physically for the game boy so you could purchase it and play it on your game boy and that's catered to the retro market yeah i mean even then this market is, the limited run is catered to the uh, people like us that want to play retro games or they want to play physical games yeah and it's holding up enough to the point where they l- like their name they have a limited run and they sell out of it so obviously yeah. at the very least from what i can see from a business standpoint if they're selling out of their stock consistently i think they're holding up pretty well yeah so and oh and i was gonna say i was gonna say i was gonna add on to that they just did that recently with uh star wars episode one racer yes. they released it they released a cartridge on the nintendo 64 yeah you know and they I mean? also released um jay and silent bob uh a cartridge for nintendo exactly yeah so, so I, I so i think i think limited run will be fine as long as they focus on and they are able to get the rights to games that people want. Yes. Yeah. No, you're right. You're right. Um, so then that, that, that makes it more of going back to these older consoles, these older retro consoles to, for the, the physical collector. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely interesting. I think it's going to be what I do already, which is, if I want to play a PC game that just came out, I'll just buy digital, play the game, and then I'm done with it. It's still in my Steam library. I can play it when I want, but I usually don't. And then all the games that I love playing over and over again, I get a physical copy and I play it on my console. Um, if if it's a console game um, or if it's a retro game that I used to have and I, I want it, I'll buy that. I still use my Nintendo cartridges all the time. Um, I still play my Dreamcast and my Sega Saturn. I mean, the retro game market, we were just talking about this recently, has skyrocketed Yeah. ever since the pandemic. It's been getting, the prices have been getting pretty bad. Yeah, so it's definitely, um, I think I think this, the the whole pandemic thing, people have opened their eyes and they've seen where it's going and they realize, oh, hey, you know, physical's not going to be here forever so let me stock up on some of my favorite old games or whatever <laughs> so so yeah have i mean you gotten any recently what have you gotten any recently uh no so i've i've just ordered some uh limited run games recently um but uh but that brings us to our next topic here um which yeah <laughs> So I don't have my collector's edition by me. Yeah, put put the mask on, man. Let let people see the uh, mask. I, I don't have it by me. Oh, you I don't have it by you? It. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's 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 in the other room. Yeah. So you showed me pictures. It's got a sweet wearable mask that you can put oh, on. Oh, so cool. Well, it's actually not wearable. There's no like um thing to attach it. Oh, okay. It's it's, it's a there's a stand though, so you can you can display it. Okay. 
All right. So next up, so we're gonna Ghost of Tsushima. Ghost of Tsushima. I'm gonna. We're. I just picked this post because it has a lot of cool uh, scenes from the game you can look at. But um, okay. So I wanted to kind of give my fresh take on it uh, since I just spent a couple hours playing before this uh, podcast. So yeah, super fresh. Super fresh. Um, the combat is very streamlined in a good way. Um, well, how many hours have you played? Two hours. Okay. Um, the, you can pick up and learn the combat very quickly, uh, which I liked. Um, but here's the thing that really sold me on this game uh, when I started playing it. And that is the fact that the game rewards bold behavior. And by that, I mean the, um, the call-out system, uh, the, the showdown system, or I think that's what it's called. So basically, in the game, you can yell at your enemies and challenge them to a duel. And they'll run up to you, and it's a game of chicken. Like, you hold your sword, and then when the time comes, you can take a, a, a death blow. Um, so, for me, <laughs> that system is it's great. Sick. Yeah, it's sick. It's sick because someone like me, I, I love to just like rush in sometimes, you know what I mean? Like, I don't yeah. want to be careful all the time. Yeah. Some, sometimes I just want to like jump in and start fighting. This system rewards that type of player. So, but it also rewards stealth players too. So it rewards both type of players, which I have never seen in a game like this. So, I mean, wh wh how do you feel about the game so far? <laughs> Uh, so I have only played 25 minutes. <laughs> okay. Okay. I've only played 25 minutes. I haven't even gotten past the prologue yet. Okay. Like I, I got my horse. That's about okay. it. Okay. Okay. Um, that being said, that being said, uh, it's a gorgeous game. It's beautiful. It is incredibly gorgeous. I can't really say much about the gameplay because I don't think I've gotten enough, uh, of a taste. Okay. It, it already feels awesome. Like it already looks incredible. Uh, one thing that I can knock it on though, and I actually would like to get your opinion on lip syncing. Oh yeah. It's, ho I'm, it's horrible. Yeah. I'm currently playing it on Japanese, yeah. uh, language and I like the voices and I like the setting, but when I see them speak and their, vo and their mouths are just completely off, it's jarring. And I kind of want to switch to English because of it. And yes. I was going to ask, have you, have you, have you, have you uh, played it in English at all? No, and that's a cool thing that I that's those are that's a cool feature I wanted to uh, touch over. So, to people who haven't played yet, you can play in uh, English. Um, or you, you can play in they called it um, Samurai Cinema, which is uh, Kurosawa. In, yeah, English subtitles with Japanese uh, voice. And then you can play it it like an old uh, samurai. Oh, that's Kurosawa mode. Yeah, and that's where it's black and white, like an old Zatoichi uh, Zatoichi uh, film. Zatoichi. Zatoichi. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which I've seen. It's it's kind of pathetic. I didn't even say it right. I've seen every single. I've seen. There's over sixty of them. That is so. Yeah, I own them all. Yeah. I love that. I love yeah. that movie. Did series. you know there was a TV series? Yes. Yeah, I have it. I That's found cool. it, and I down down I download. So no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> a very no, rare. Yeah, Zatoichi very... is amazing. It is and, amazing. And uh, Kurosawa mode, uh, it's definitely cool because they also play with the audio. They tone back the audio, mm -hmm. so it's very in the style of those older films. Yes, because the, the audio thing... is very quiet in those older films. But the only thing that I would say is that since it desaturates everything, you kind of miss out on all the color and all the beauty that Sucker Punch has brought into this world. Yeah. I'm not playing. I'm, I'm Tsushima. Yeah, I'm playing so, in the regular I don't know. I'd, I'd probably suggest it as a second playthrough. Yes. Yeah. So I'm, I'm just playing in the color. So here's the Same. thing. The Japanese voices are too good. 
I'm just going to yeah. live with the bad lip syncing. <laughs> I'm just going to live well, with well, it. Man. Let's see. I want to, I want to, I want to check it out because honestly, the lip syncing is really, it's, it's, it's distracting for me. Yeah. It, granted, it's only 25 minutes. So maybe I need to give it some more time. But um, the only reason why I didn't give it more time or haven't played as much is because I was beating Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition. I okay. spent 122 hours on it. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. And I, I haven't even played the Future Connected yet. The, uh, the DLC that's attached to the game. Okay. So I know you love I, that game. I need to beat that first. Yeah, I know. I know that's one of your favorite games. Yes, love it. Um, so yeah, I. But here's what I can say. I recommend getting this. This is the last exclusive for the PS4 generation. Yes. That being said, I heard that physical copies are limited right now. Oh really? Yes, and I saw an article um, recently. <laughs> people who pre-ordered on Amazon, their their some of them say that their uh, wait date is in September. So they wow. didn't they didn't produce a bunch of copies of these physically. So I mean, it, it's probably because of the obviously the pandemic. It's it. I think it's because the pandemic, and also every. At the end of every console generation, the last games usually are limited and end up becoming rare, uh, physical copies. Yeah. Um, the collector's edition is straight up gorgeous. It's art. Yeah. I love it so much. So, and the mask that's on it, like, yeah, I got to show it later, some other time. Yeah. But yeah, so, so yeah, get a physical if you can of this because the game is. Um, Apparently, it's hard to get a physical copy right now, so I'm glad I uh, pre-ordered. And again, again, that plays to the exact same thing we were just talking about. It's an investment. Yes. You keep that game. You keep it physically. That boy will uh, will raise in price, especially for like the last game, uh, the la- the last uh, pardon games of any system. Yeah. It, it, if they don't make a, a lot of them, if it's a lower print run, those shoot up in price considerably. Yes. Yeah. So this one, this one, I'm expecting this to hold its value at least for a little while. Um, maybe yeah. go up even later if they don't come out with like a, I don't know, like a remastered with more content later on. But who knows? Um, Fair. They, they did that with. Uh, yeah. No. No. Go on. Yeah. Yeah. They so. did that with uh, Last of Us. Exactly. Which really bothered me, but. <laughs> Anyways, I mean, um, I mean, playing on the PS4 was a lot of fun. The yeah. higher frame rate was a little funky though, because uh, enemies moved at, uh, at higher speeds yeah. than than I was able to react. Yeah, I was like, "What the? This wasn't made for this frame rate." Yeah, no. <laughs> um, so yeah, and then uh, I wanted to uh, quickly go over. Um, there's a uh, a new No Man's Sky. Um, content uh it's free so microsoft is giving this out for free um so basically uh have you played this no you know what but after seeing this i might get it because the game is below 30 bucks right now i think yes and so basically what they did was they improved the combat system um here let me see if i can uh, show you it kind of this trailer kind of reminds me of a dead space a little bit obviously okay. it's nowhere near as creepy as dead space was but as atmospheric yeah it's it's atmospheric so what they did was they improved the combat system uh and how the weapons work um they uh and what they did was they added a bunch of freighters in the world and these freighters have been abandoned and they're giving off distress signals so you can actually go in them and investigate, and a lot of them are filled with hostile aliens. So that's cool. Yeah, so it's pretty cool. Um, and uh, they also gave uh, players the ability to um, customize their own freighter as well. So um, yeah, I mean, it's just a yeah, it, it just gives me that Dead Space vibe. Um, Obviously, I think this trailer is horribly done because it keeps cutting in and out. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, it looks it looks pretty interesting. Um, have you played yeah. it? Yeah, 
No, I have not. Um, I remember the first trailer for No Man's Sky, and I was like, that looks interesting. Yeah. And then it became No Man's Lie. Yes. And that's a whole story in and of itself. And But... I, I have They've to They've slowly and steadily been been yes. gaining people back. Yeah. I, I, I I can't fault them for that, but yeah. I'm just not interested. Yeah, yeah. Um and, and there How about yourself? Let's be real. Um we've got a couple space sims on the horizon, one being EA uh squadrons. Okay. Uh, so I'm that's I'm, a that's Star Wars. That's Star Wars, yeah. But uh it's it And that's VR. They're, they're at, yeah, but I think you can play it regularly too. I think it's both. Oh yeah, but I'm yeah. just saying that's an added thing for VR because I know you just got your VR. That it's going to be so much fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I'm definitely and looking then, forward to and that. And then uh, I'm also excited for Pragmata, even though we haven't even seen much. Yeah. Much in terms of gameplay. Yeah, we haven't, and uh, they, they, they copyrighted claim our video when we uh, we showed that. So, oh, a copyright strike. <laughs> it's not a strike. They just okay. claimed it. Okay. But I can't we have no advertising anyway, so who cares? <laughs> Fair enough. Um but yeah, uh didn't know Capcom would do that. Um anyways. <laughs> hey Capcom, do you want to sponsor us? Yeah, do you want to sponsor us? Uh, I mean, I'm excited. <laughs> uh we do we do cover all their games anyways. <laughs> um Yeah, I mean, I'm super excited for Resident Evil Village, which yes. I heard they don't even want you to say that it's Resident Evil 8, by the way. Yeah. Which is super weird. Because, because the, the, the Go ahead. So I uh, two episodes ago, I did a, a deep dive into uh, Resident Evil Village. Yes. Um, from a uh, somebody uh, posted a Q and A from a um, Famitsu uh, article where they interviewed one of the developers, but it was in ja- yes. it's, it's in Japanese. But someone posted it in English, and essentially the reason why they're calling it. So first of all. It's Resident Evil Village and it's Resident Evil 8 because 8 is in the title, right? Yes. And that was very slick how they did that. But the reason that they want it to be Resident Evil The Village is because they consider The Village a um, almost as if it's a character. Okay. Yeah, so so they're, they're, they want to emphasize the importance of The Village. At least that's what I read when I, I went over went over that Q and A. So but um yeah I mean d- t- don't get me started. I'm I'm totally waiting for that game. And I have to beat seven first. They said that it's it's a continuation of seven if you want to see what happened yeah. to Ethan. So definitely play seven first before you play Resident Evil Village. Um see so, if it's available for VR on PC. Because it's available for P- VR on PS4. Oh it's not. That was only for PlayStation. Damn. Yeah, they only did that for PlayStation, which sucks, because I, I wanted to try it on PC, but... Yeah, that'd be cool. Um, all right, so finally, let's... Also, beat Resident Evil 2. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I got it. You know what sucks, man, is... Uh, you. I was you so suck. excited for two. 3, because I loved 3. And I... Uh, yeah. Just so everyone knows, I have a... Uh, I actually have a review for the original 3 from Dreamcast on the channel, so if you can, if you want to watch that... I also uh, did a re- link link below. Yeah, yeah, I'll link it. I also did a review for the new three, which was not so. I was not so uh, pleasant in that review because th- they just didn't do the original any justice, in my opinion. But, anyways, um, yeah. So let's uh, end up with our usual uh, releases. See if there's anything good coming out. Oh yeah, another thing. Um, Death Stranding came out for PC. Yeah. Yes. That's, an, that's another reason why I want to move into PC because I hear that game is gorgeous on PC. And I loved Death Stranding yeah. on a um on uh, on a PS4. Yeah. So so and I I mean I'd like to do a little shout out real quick, if you don't mind. Uh, can you show me? Oh snap. The Art of Death Stranding. It's usually $40. Uh-huh. On Amazon, it's uh, down to twenty five ninety nine. Oh, okay. Nice. Yeah, so... so... In, case, in case anyone wants... Because I'm, I'm a huge fan of, like, like video game paraphernalia and, like, art books, so... Yeah, yeah so... Death Stranding is... It took me a while to beat it. <laughs> you remember you were, like, pulling my leg? Come on, man, finish it. 
Yeah. Uh, but I did beat it. Um, and I did post a review on it on this channel as well. So, um, Link yeah, that below. yeah, we both liked it. Um, yeah. you loved it. I, I, I loved you it. You loved it. Yeah. I, there was some, I definitely had some problems with the game. Uh, but I feel like the problems I had were like very common problems that other people had. It wasn't anything in particular, you know? Um, yes. and also I'm not, I'm not the type of person who is like drawn to those long story, you know, games, uh, like yeah, you are. Which is interesting. Yeah. I'm happy that you beat it, that you, that you were yeah. able to accomplish it because I know you don't like those kinds of games, but some, what, what about it like made you want to beat it or was it because you wanted to review it? Well, no, well, it's not just review it. Um, I started to kind of like his role in the environment more than anything else and i just kind of like felt some kind of a uh, peace peace yeah like especially when i was going up and down the mountain ranges it's a chill game yeah yeah it's like a game like you could wake up in the morning and like pour a cup of coffee and just sit there and play it for a couple hours yeah <laughs> you know what and i mean like beautiful yeah it's a beautiful game yeah i'd say i i, I if anything I'd say like Ghost of Tsushima, <laughs> Tsushima is very gorgeous, but this the the Decima engine and what Kojima did with it, yeah, so beautiful. One, yeah. one, one of the premier games on uh, PS4 as well. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so yeah, let's uh, let's finish up with uh, what's coming up. Um, not much coming up this week, but so do you know about Carry On? Because this game yes, actually that, caught that my was eye. Part of the Devolver Digital uh like e3 some semi e3 presentation yeah. and it actually looks really cool it's like a metroidvania type game but you're playing as you know the movie the thing yes you're playing as the thing practically as 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 you're running around and like consuming eating people. everything yeah no it looks awesome unfortunately there's this trailer that's going on yeah let's <laughs> uh give this a second here. But no, car carry on actually looks really cool. I I I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Car yeah, carry I think it's carry on. Cause isn't carry on dead meat? Like what something birds like eat or something like that. But yeah, see, you you start off as like this small like creature that's escaped the lab, and then you go around trying to consume, um, pretty much enemies and or get humans, bigger, right? And you get larger and larger and. Even though you become more threatening, you're also a larger target. Yeah. So you have to, you have to figure out ways like it's, you know puzzle adventure. Very cool. Yeah. And then I'm also excited for Rogue Legacy two. Okay. Rogue Legacy is a um, procedurally generated uh, roguelike, mm -hmm. and it's really cool. Like I I loved the first one. It came out initially on I believe PS3. Okay, and that's where that's where I played it initially, and then now it's on Switch. It's it's on everything now. Yeah. So this and the cool thing about this. Yeah. Huh? Well, the cool thing about this is that your characters there's permadeath. Uh huh. But you're playing as the child of the previous character. Yes. And each yes. And each and and each child has both their strengths and their weaknesses, and some of them are really really funny. Like one will be colorblind, and so it creates you know everything's black and white or grayscale on the game. <laughs> And then, or, or sometimes one will have like uh, a fear, of, like like weird fears. I forget. Um, one will have an audio issue, so like maybe the audio will pop in and out a little bit. Yeah, I it's remember very, watching you play this. Yes, I loved yeah, it. Yeah, I remember. So I'm excited for this. <sighs> but I got bad news because just looking at this, it says it's PC exclusive right now. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's limited. It's a limited time thing. Okay. All right. Cool. So yeah, you. I guess we'll just get it when it comes out. Um, oh yeah. Roki. Yeah. Don't know anything about this game. Uh, looks like it's an adventure title, and it's on PC and Switch. And then okay, so Rock of Ages three. Um, do you know anything about this game? Never heard of it. Me neither. Um, now Crisis Remastered. The, the Crisis Remastered on Nintendo Switch is like hilarious to me. It is, but I, I think it's also coming out on Xbox because I remember reading a, a article where somebody was saying that 
they spotted a uh, a page that popped up on the Xbox store that had Crisis Remastered in it. So okay. I, I think I think they kind of leaked that that it's. I mean, Crisis be on... came out on the Xbox 360. Yeah, yeah. I but think it's... I just I remember I remember back in the day just like Crisis being kind of. Uh, a litmus test for your PC. It's like, can you run Crisis on high settings? Yeah, it was. It was like the de facto test to see if your PC was man enough. <laughs> yes, yes. And now it's running on this dinky ass Nintendo Switch. It's portable. Yeah, it's hilarious. Yeah. Um. So yeah, no I mean, um, Switch, I love it. I'm just saying. Yeah, yeah. I I had it on PC back in the day. Um. So yeah, I mean, that's it uh, for this week. Uh, thanks everyone uh, for tuning in and uh, we'll, yeah. s- we'll see you all next time take care and have a good one hey everyone thanks for watching this episode of games i speak if you like the episode please subscribe and leave a comment below and we'll see you all next time <laughs>